There are a lot of people out there suggesting that taking omega-3s is paramount for your health and will prevent disease and decrease mortality, but that might not actually be the case. We'll be discussing exactly why that is in today's episode, which is episode 105 of the Energy Balance Podcast, a podcast where we explore health and nutrition from the bioenergetic view and teach you how to maximize your cellular energy to maximize your health. Today's episode is part one of a three-part series exploring the relationship between omega-3s, mortality, and lifespan. And in today's episode in particular, we'll be discussing whether the research suggesting that omega-3s decrease mortality is valid. We'll also be discussing omega-6 intake as a major uh, confounding variable when looking at omega-3 research. We'll be talking about the dramatic lifespan lowering effect of omega-3s and total polyunsaturated fatty acids across all species. We'll also be discussing how omega-3s increase susceptibility to oxidative stress and damage. And we'll be looking at the Maasai diet as an example of a low omega-3 diet that shows high omega-3s in the red blood cells. As always, to take a look at the studies or articles or anything else that we reference throughout today's episode, head over to jfeldmanwellness.com slash podcast. And with that, let's get started. So we've talked quite a bit about omega-3s and why we're not the biggest fans of them for health in general. And I'll link back to quite a few episodes where we've discussed this. And we've also discussed this on various guest podcast appearances, both together and individually. And sometimes it's led to a bit of a discussion or disagreement regarding certain aspects of the omega-3s, which is why we're revisiting it today and digging into some details as far as the relationship between omega-3s and lifespan. So I, I figured it was worth kind of mentioning some of the background here. We together uh, did a podcast with Ben Pakulski, and one of the main topics we talked about was omega-3s, and there seemed to be some disagreements there. The episode hasn't aired. I'm not sure if it's going to, potentially because of that, but we, of course, don't know for sure. And then also, uh, I've been on Mark Bell and Chris Bell's podcast, and it was a bit of a discussion there for sure with the omega-3s. Again, considering that in the health sphere, omega-3s are pretty unanimously considered to be healthy. So, you know, of course, when we're voicing an opposite opinion there, there's going to be more of a discussion. It seems like Thomas DeLauer picked up on that uh, episode and had uh, mentioned in, in a different podcast that, you know, there are concerns about, you know, lipid peroxidation of omega-3 products, but that's why he uses cod liver oil. And we've discussed specifically in an episode why that does not actually avoid the peroxidation issue. So I'll link back to that as well. And, uh, and I had done a debate with Dr. Dom D'Agostino focused on you know, carbs versus fats as a fuel and low-carb diets versus moderate or high-carb diets. And in that discussion, we also got to discussing PUFA or polyunsaturated fats. And he was mentioning so, you know, why he's not ready to say that he's concerned about omega-6s because the randomized controlled trials aren't there to support that they're problematic, even though mechanistically they're potentially problematic. And the research he did in mice and rats, you know, showing that the amount of omega-6s in the phospholipids correlates or, you know, leads to increases in lipid peroxidation and, and all of that, you know, even though that's concerning, he wasn't ready to say that omega-6 or omega-6s are problematic and that we should avoid them. However, he was, uh, you know, pretty strongly arguing for the consumption of omega-3s. And this was actually on the basis of correlational data, despite, you know, that not being enough or, you know, it wasn't even mechanistic data so much. He was just talking about correlations or associations between omega-3 content of phospholipids in humans and, and uh, reductions in mortality. And again, just to be clear, like this was a situation where he was saying that data was enough despite a lack of randomized controlled trials and things like that, which seemed to, to kind of be contradictory. But regardless, considering that this has been a major point of discussion or disagreement, and, I, and it was also something that Ben Pakulski had brought up on, you know, when we were you know, doing that guest uh, recording for his podcast, was this association between the omega-3 content of membranes, phospholipids, uh, red blood cells, and, and uh, mortality and lifespan. So with that in mind, that's what we're going to be Focusing on today is looking at that data that is showing a correlation between 
omega-3 levels either in the blood or in the phospholipids and longevity. And to be clear, this is just epidemiological data, and that's something that we'll be discussing as well. Uh, this is not you know, experimental models. These are not randomized controlled trials, but we'll be digging into all of that and going through the studies that are A, showing this association, and then B, we'll be going through quite a bit of research discussing why even though that association data is there, it doesn't necessarily mean that we should be consuming more omega-3s, and there's various confounding variables that we'll dig into as well. And uh, I do want to mention also, of course, we've kind of mentioned a handful of different names here, and we'd be happy to discuss this further with any of these people or, or anyone else. You know, we're happy to discuss this topic and, and have those discussions with people who are on the opposite side. But uh, yeah, wanted to delve into this research quite a bit. And this is something that largely I'll be spearheading, you know, kind of as a result of my debate with Dom and that, you know, the omega-3s being something that we had some disagreements on. But of course, Mike, you'll be joining in here as well and bringing quite a bit of insight. So is there anything you want to add before we dig in? Yeah, so I, I wanted to add that not only are we going to go through the association studies between red blood cell omega-3s and then uh, total mortality risk. We're also going to, so that's kind of one piece of information, one set of data to look at. We're going to be adding context on multiple different areas, looking at the, like trying to bring a larger picture and a larger body of research around the omega-3 question. And this is from the perspective of I with your debate with Dom, where Dom was saying that he was okay with consuming omega-3s on a consistent basis because of these uh, these association studies showing m higher amounts of omega-3s in the red blood cell membranes and then decreases, decreasing risk of total mortality. So basically, he his statement was basing off, I think, this particular piece of evidence, or at least that's what he mentioned. And so what we want to do is discuss that piece of evidence, and then we want to start to add other pieces of evidence to create a larger picture instead of just having this singular set uh, or the singular perspective. We want to kind of round out the perspective altogether. So that's that's kind of what we're going to do here today. That's going to be the the focus. And then the initial prompt for that was your the some of the things that you mentioned, some of the podcasts we had been on, and then specifically some of the statements that uh, Dom had made um, or the things that he had implied. Right, right. Yeah. And, the, and, and that's a great point. Something great to point out is that there are a lot that, you know, obviously there's a lot of research and a lot of studies that will have a particular conclusion, but you can't base a perspective on, you know, a concluding sentence of a paper. It's really important to dig into the larger context, the other research, the mechanisms, as well as the details of any individual paper and where they're, how they're coming to their conclusion. So we will be providing all that today. And with that, let's, let's dig into some of this data that, that Dom was citing and, and look at this correlational uh, relationship between omega-3 in omega-3s in the phospholipids and mortality and longevity. Yeah, let's jump in. So let's dig into that. And, and as you kind of alluded to, correlation does not equal causation. And that's a really important uh, piece here when it comes to looking at observational data. These are not randomized controlled trials. These are not interventions. These are observational data where we're looking at associations between how much omega-3s somebody has in their phospholipids and what the outcome then is based on that correlation. So there are a handful of these studies. There's four in particular that, you know, we'll kind of reference here. There's, a, you know, a, f a few others. And of these four and of most of them, three of them are led by a researcher and sponsored by a researcher who's uh, William Harris. And we'll discuss why that's relevant in a bit. But there's a few different studies of his between 2017 and 2021 that all basically show that the levels of DHA and EPA, which are the main long chain omega-3 fatty acids in the red blood cell fatty acids in the erythrocyte phospholipids, uh, or not only phospholipids, but sometimes just the, the erythrocyte fatty acid pool, were associated with reduced cardiovascular disease mortality and reduced all-cause mortality. So there's a few of these. I'll just kind of read off the titles in case anybody's interested, but I'll, of course, I'll cite these in the notes as always. So the one from 2021 is a paper titled Using an Erythrocyte Fatty Acid Fingerprint to Predict Risk of All-Cause Mortality, the Framingham Offspring Cohort. And uh, a couple of these studies are based on this Framingham Cohort, and then another one's based on the Women's Health Initiative 
uh, memory study. So that's that 2021 paper. Again, it's showing the same thing as this 2018 paper, erythrocyte long chain omega-3 fatty acid levels are inversely associated with mortality and the and with incident cardiovascular disease, the Framingham Heart Study. And then the last one is in that women's health study. It's titled Red Blood Cell Polyunsaturated Fatty Acids and Mortality in the Women's Health Initiative Memory Study. Uh, and that one, they didn't actually see any correlation with cardiovascular disease mortality, but they did see an association between increased levels of DHA and EPA in the red blood cell fatty acids and reduced all-cause all cause mortality. And then the last study that I'll just reference here uh, is from a different uh, researcher uh, by the last name of Mozafarian in the paper. And I think this is the one that Dom had kind of alluded to when I discussed this with him. Uh, the title is Plasma Phospholipid Long Chain Omega-3 Fatty Acids and Total and Cause-Specific Mortality in Older Adults, the Cardiovascular Health Study. This is a paper from 2013 and was looking at omega-3 levels in the plasma phospholipids, so not erythrocytes, not red blood cells, uh, but the plasma phospholipids and showing an association uh, with reduced all-cause mortality and cardiovascular disease mortality. And this was the one uh, that suggested that between the highest levels and lowest levels of omega-3s and the plasma phospholipids, there was a 2.2 year difference in lifespan, uh, meaning that the higher, the higher omega-3s led to a 2.2 year increase in lifespan or was associated with, I should say. And that was something that was mentioned by Dom, which is why I think this was the study he was alluding to. So th this is for, there's these four papers that do show clear correlation between omega-3 levels in red blood cell fatty acids or in plasma phospholipids and mortality. So that's kind of going to be the basis of what we're going to be digging into is confounding variables related to that, issues with it, and what other things this could mean outside of the idea that we should just consume more omega-3s. Yeah, and one thing I want to add just for for the audience in case people aren't aware. So an erythrocyte is a red blood cell. They're the same thing. It's just a different name. And then a phospholipid, so we're looking at phospholipids in erythrocytes and then in plasma. So in plasma, it's just the portion of blood that isn't the the cells, the red blood cells, the white blood cells, et cetera. It's kind of just that serous fluid. Um, and then a phospholipid is essentially fatty acids. So it's usually two fatty acids bonded to a phosphate head. So if you ever look at it, if you ever look at the uh, diagram of a cell membrane, the phospholipids are the little things that make the cell membrane and they can be circulating in just like the, the blood as it's fluid or it can be part of the cell. So what they're looking at in these studies and what they're trying to see is, is there a, if it, with a certain profile, a certain fatty acid composition of these plasma phospholipids or the red blood cell phospholipids, are there effects on cardiovascular disease, stroke, heart attacks, things like that? all cause mortality. So basically dying from any particular reason, they're trying to see, uh, is there a relationship between those? And a lot of times what they're doing with these studies is they're measuring the plasma phospholipids or the red blood cell phospholipids by a blood draw on these participants, or they're pulling from data sets where they actually did measure these things. And then they're just looking to see what happened a couple of years later on to these people. So they're not really, they're not doing any specific intervention in, in these studies. They're just looking, okay, this person, their red blood cells had this much omega-3s. Okay, what happened in 20 years? So were they more likely to die than the person who had less omega-3s or more omega-3s? So that's all the studies are really looking at. And it's, again, this is where it's, it's just an observation. There's not a specific intervention. They're not giving them fish. They're not giving them fish oil. They're just trying to see where things are out. So a couple points about that is you're you know, if you're just drawing that the omega-3, uh, if you're just drawing that blood set, that 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 lab one time and then seeing what happens 20 years later, obviously a lot can be adjusted in that time frame. So that thing with that in mind, they're still seeing an association. So the association, the 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 signal is coming through the noise in the data, and they're they are seeing that that's there, but it doesn't tell us anything else as to like why that could be a thing. So that that just a couple things to think about is how are these studies being done? What exactly are they looking at, et cetera? And one last piece I want to add to that is when you're looking at the composition of phospholipids, there's three types of fats you can have in a phospholipid. A, a saturated fat, or, or and a saturated fat is there are groups of fats. So you have saturated fatty acids, monounsaturated fatty acids, 
and then polyunsaturated fatty acids. And when you look at polyunsaturated fatty acids, there's two main types of polyunsaturated fatty acids. A lot of you probably already know omega-6 and then omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids. The researchers here are looking specifically to see what's going on with omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids in the association. They're not really looking at the, so much the other ones because basically the main signal seems to be around these that they're pointing out. Uh, so just, and Jay will get to maybe an underlying reason why in just a second or right now, but those, that's generally what's going on in these studies. That's what they're looking at. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's really important context to keep in mind. All of that is. And so beyond the general notion that this is just correlation and association, uh, which of course already uh, leaves you know, leave some room for interpretation or questioning, as you were saying, we're just looking at one point in time and then what happens later. To say that then we should assume that there's causation here is one, you know, one big issue, right? Correlation does not equal causation. But then also what else could be going on that could account for these things? Um, and you mentioned like looking at outcomes 20 years later. I want to say they're looking at, I think one of them was 11 years later. I don't think that any of them were any longer than that. So it's something to keep in mind as well. Of course, there's always there's limitations to these things. But there's also quite a few confounding variables that we'll dig into that can also affect omega-3 levels in the phospholipids that's going to be important to consider and will confound whether we just want to be consuming omega-3s as a result here. But before we dig into that, I think one of the first confounding variables to discuss, which of course doesn't throw out the studies, but is always important to consider, is conflict of interest. And so William Harris, who's the the lead researcher and also the one who funded those three, the three papers that he did, is the president of a company called Omega Quant Analytics LLC, which does red blood cell fatty acid analysis and also performed it for these studies. And obviously, there is a benefit to showing a strong correlation here to the owner of this company or a huge benefit to the company if that correlation is found to be the case, because it produces a lot of business for someone who is testing this for a population, whether it's a patient population in a medical sense or just in a, a general consumer sense, because if people are told that, hey, the more omega-3s you have, uh, the better your lifespan, and here's a test that you can pay for in order to uh, find out how long you're going to live, essentially, and whether you're getting enough omega-3s, you know, there's obviously business incentive there. Uh, business incentive there. So that's worth mentioning. And uh, there's one other researcher who was involved in the studies, McBurney, who also is involved with that company as a consultant, as well as a bunch of other top supplement and food companies, which might also have interest here in seeing a benefit to omega-3s. So a another important thing to consider when it comes to these studies is that they did try to control for various things to try to rule out the healthy user bias. So the idea behind healthy user bias is that Somebody who is, let's say, consuming more omega-3s is probably going to be doing other things that are also health-oriented because they, uh, they're they doing this other this one thing that is to improve their health. So they're generally more health-conscious, health-oriented people. Generally, they're going to be exercising more and you know have less health issues as a whole. And so that can be a huge confounding variable. They did try to control for a lot of those things. But uh, and so they, you know, they controlled for activity levels. They controlled for BMI. They controlled for health conditions, but a huge thing that they didn't control for, I'm assuming because they didn't have the data, uh, although I'm not sure the exact reason, uh, was diet. So what this means is that in general, and it wouldn't be surprising to see a strong correlation between people who had higher omega-3s in their phospholipids and a healthier diet in general, which could mean a ton of different things. But with the assumption that these people are more health conscious, you would I think it would be safe to assume they're probably having a healthier diet and that could confound this research because what you're essentially saying is, well, people who had a healthier diet had lower chance of mortality, that kind of thing. Another huge piece of that is that the omega-6 intake specifically is not controlled for or omega-3 intake. Neither were actually looked at in the study and that would have been incredibly helpful to be able to see the levels of intake for those things because that would draw much allow for someone to draw a much stronger conclusion as far as whether omega-3 intake was important here and actually was the driving factor behind the increase in omega-3s in phospholipids and mortality. 
When it comes to creating a healthy diet, there's a lot of conflicting information out there, and that's why I've created the Energy Balance Food Guide to help you determine exactly what to eat to optimally support your metabolism and help you lose weight, improve your digestion, get amazing sleep, boost your energy, and so much more. The Energy Balance Food Guide is a one-page infographic that organizes foods on a spectrum based on how effectively they support your metabolism, and it also has a separate spectrum that adjusts the scale for you in the case that you're dealing with various digestive symptoms. This food guide makes it extremely easy to get started with a bioenergetic approach to optimizing your health, so head over to jfeldmanwellness.com guide, that's G-U-I-D-E, to download your free Energy Balance Food Guide. The reason why omega-6 is, it is important, well, for one, for one reason, uh, which is a big one, we'll, we'll dig into the details in a second, but in general, if we consume lower amounts of omega-6s, that will increase the omega-3s in the phospholipids. Uh, essentially, the amount of, the, they kind of crowd each other out or they compete for space in the phospholipids. And so if you're not, it's, it's essentially this big confounding variable where we can look at the amount of omega-3 in the membrane essentially as a proxy for how much or how little omega-6 you're consuming. And so that could be a huge, could play a huge role here and could actually be a much more causative factor in terms of mortality is the amount of omega-6 that's consumed rather than the amount of omega-3 that's consumed because both are going to affect the omega-3 levels in the phospholipids. And in one of these studies, in the 2018 one by, uh, by Harris, the one titled Erythrocyte Long-Chain Omega-3 Fatty Acid Levels Are Inversely Associated with Mortality and with Incident Cardiovascular Disease, the Framingham Heart Study, they looked at omega-6 levels of the phospholipids in the blood. And what they did was they looked at the ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 and that relationship with mortality. And when you look at the highest versus the lowest quintile of omega-6 to omega-3 ratio, there was a huge increase in risk of mortality when you have the higher level of omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. And that increase in mortality, which you can see here, 1.58, was stronger, uh, like considerably greater than the decrease in mortality that you saw from the highest quintile of omega-3 fatty acids in the phospholipids compared to the lowest quintile of omega-3 fatty acids. So another way of saying that is that a stronger predictor of mortality would have been the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio in the phospholipids. And again, the reason why this is so important is because what this can mean is that the omega-3 index if these fatty, of the phospholipids, the amount of omega-3 in the phospholipids, which the index they actually use as a separate marker of just DHA and EPA, but regardless, the amount of omega-3s in the phospholipids can just be an indicator of a lack of omega-6s in the phospholipids and, and potentially a lack of omega-6s in the diet. And so that's a huge confounding variable here, and I'll let you chime in, Mike. Yeah, the other thing I want to point out is if you look at all the columns, so you have total cardiovascular disease, total uh, congestive heart disease, total stroke, uh, cardiovascular disease mortality, cancer mortality, other mortality, any mortality. You look at all the top headings there. For besides cardiovascular disease mortality and cancer mortality, all of the trends are also significant. So what you're seeing is that it, with you're saying for the omega six to omega three ratio, omega six to omega three ratio exactly. So you're seeing is for all of those different groups, as you increase your omega-6 ratio in your red blood cell phospholipids here, omega-3s, you're seeing a much higher um, risk of these particular uh, events. So cardiovascular disease events, stroke events, et cetera. Uh, this is also important because if you look at, if you start to pull other data, we won't show it here, but we can link it. When you look and see the trend in change in consumption, of omega-6 and omega-3 intake over the past century within the United States and overall, you see a huge, huge increase in omega-6 intake and a relatively flat, if not small, decrease in omega-3 intake. And this is important to, when, to consider in these studies be, when you start to understand there's, there's also another series of studies where they show that just decreasing omega-6 intake, going on a low linoleic acid diet, is able to increase the omega-3 content of the red blood cell phospholipids significantly. Like somewhere, I think it's like by like 50% or something like that. So when you look at that in and of itself, now you're starting to see, okay, well, we're seeing that omega-3 content in the red blood cell phospholipids is associated with this longevity. 
or, or this decreased mortality. But at the same time, is that a, is the omega-3 content of the red blood cell phospholipids because these people are just eating tons of fish and taking fish oil supplements? Or is it because their linoleic acid content in their diet is lower? And another piece to keep in mind here is that the, lino, the omega-6 fatty acids, linoleic acid and arachidonic acid, produce some extremely potent inflammatory mediators called, and they're, in the, they're called icosanoids. Omega-3 produces mediators well. They're a little bit different. It doesn't mean that I'm a fan of omega-3s, but, but the very high overloaded tissues of omega-6, you're going to have a light, you're more likely under different stressful situations to have significantly more inflammatory states. So there's multiple other pieces to look at here. Um, and it, it's important to also understand that context of we also have this change over time of omega-6 content like to extreme levels compared to what it was previously. And we can go back and we can look and see, okay, well, omega-3 content wasn't so drastically high then. It wasn't like in 1908, they were slamming fish oil pills. It was they just weren't mm -hmm. slamming soybean oil. Yeah, which is a great point. Really, really important point. And as we'll talk about as well in one particular population, one uh, native population, they still had a very high omega-6 to omega-3 intake, but their total omega-6 intake was still way lower than the average population. It was still not low. It still was, you know, I think it was about 7% as we'll dig into, but it was just way lower than average. So these people don't have to be on a bioenergetic diet where they're minimizing PUFA to an extreme extent to see this sort of result. They could still be eating a considerable amount of omega-6s, but just way less than the, than the, the other the population. Diet. Yeah. Exactly. And that could account for benefit as well. And so there is, uh, there's a, a study that's looking at a couple of things. One, the, we'll, we'll, we'll dig into these, these, uh, a couple different studies looking at what happens when we consume less omega-6 and how that increases omega-3s. But in this study, they just looked at increasing omega-3s and the effect on omega-6, which is another uh, confounding variable here. So th that's directly related. So the title of this paper is U.S. Family Physicians Overestimate Personal Omega-3 Fatty Acid Biomarker Status Associations with Fatty Fish and Omega-3 Supplement Intake. And so there's two quotes. In the first one, they state that omega-6 percentage uh, in the highly unsaturated fatty acids decreased with increased reported fatty fish consumption and omega-3 supplement use. And second, significant relation were observed among the, uh, the three biome biomarkers of omega-3 status that we calculated. Omega-3 index and percentage of omega-6 in the highly unsaturated fatty acids were inversely related with an adjusted R2 of 0 0.688. So this was looking at whole blood fatty acid profiles, but still what they're showing here is that Again, it might even if we're going to say these people were taking omega-3s, the benefit might have nothing to do with the omega-3s, but might instead have to do with the reduction in omega-6s, which again, is just another possibility to consider here. Yeah. The other thing to keep in mind here, and this is something that if you go through any of this research, you'll start to see is that omega-6 and omega-3 have a degree of competition with each other. So when really mm. high intakes of omega-6, which you tend to see in most Western diets at this point, because it, even in France, they're starting to use vegetable oils over butter. Um, what you start to see is that the, uh, the omega-6s will crowd out omega-3s from being incorporated or utilized within the different enzymes and then also within inside the phospholipids. So it's not to, it, basically what you're seeing is, it, you could just be seeing is this like massive omega-6 intake. And that's, that's the main point that we're getting at. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. And, and so that brings us to this next very related uh, situation, which is what exactly is red blood cell phospholipids telling us and what are serum fatty acids telling us? Because they aren't telling us exactly like this is what was being consumed. There's correlation, but there's, there's not exact relationships. And as we're saying, this can be due to crowding out and other factors as well, like heredity. So there's a couple things to keep in mind. One is when looking at fatty acids in the plasma, these are extremely short term. They're going to be affected by what your diet was for just several days before or something like that. And so that's not necessarily uh, a great marker of long term diet. Uh, at, like it's not really affected by too much. It's just affected by what you could have eaten most recently. Whereas when you're looking at the phospholipid uh, fatty acid composition, you're looking at more of a of indicator of the last two to three months. 
uh, will be impacted by diet over the last few months. So that's going to be at least a little bit better, but we just want to keep that difference in mind. The other thing is there is still, there's a correlation between red blood cell phospholipids and tissue phospholipids. So looking at the phospholipids of skeletal muscle mitochondria or liver uh, mitochondria, but there's, it's not an exact uh, exact translation. There is correlation. But so again, there's a difference there between these things that's important to uh, to keep in mind, that this is not the equivalent of just saying, here are the exact percentages in the tissues of these different fatty acids. Yeah. The next piece when it comes to these red blood cell, the issues with the red blood cell fatty acid composition is again, this omega-6 versus omega-3 situation. And so there's some pretty strong evidence that low omega-6s will increase omega-3s even without an increased consumption of omega-3s. So we'll get into a couple studies about this. The first one is titled, uh, it's titled, A Low Omega-6 Polyunsaturated Fatty Acid Diet Increases Omega-3 Long-Chain PUFA Status in Plasma Phospholipids in Humans. So they have a concluding quote here that states, These data demonstrate that reducing linoleic acid intake for four weeks increases omega-3 long-chain PUFA status in humans in the absence of increased long-chain omega-3 PUFA intake. So what they essentially had was a, a group of people where they decreased their omega-6 intake considerably and did not increase their omega-3s at all. There was actually a slight decrease in omega-3 intake. So their diets were only around 0.12 to 0.15% omega-3s, which is super, super low. And there was also a significant decrease in the ALA intake. ALA is one of the omega-3s from 1.23 grams to 0.57 grams. So overall, they had no increase in omega-3 intake. If anything, there was a slight decrease. And despite that, just by lowering the omega-6s, the omega-3s in the phospholipids, including EPA, DPA, and DHA, the primary long-chain omega-3s, increased for a total of from a total of 5.53% to 6.22%, which is a really large increase when looking at omega-3 content of fatty acids. So there was a pretty major increase here just by decreasing the omega-6s. And as they discuss in the paper, this is largely due to a lack of crowding out the omega-3s. So just consuming fewer omega-6s, even if there's no increase in omega-3s, even if you're on a very low omega-3 diet, will increase the amount of omega-3s in the fatty acids. So they, this was, this, the study was mostly looking at, well, they looked at both plasma and phospholipids, but it's a short-term study. So as they describe in this following quote, they didn't see any changes in the phospholipids, only in the fatty acids, but had they continued the study on for longer, they expected to have seen changes in phospholipids since those take a little bit longer. So what they mentioned is that in contrast to the effects in plasma, there was no change in EPA, DPA, or DHA content of erythrocyte or red blood cell phospholipids after four weeks on the low linoleic acid diet in the study. This is consistent with the results of two previous four-week Australian trials, but differs from that of McIntosh and colleagues who reported a 51% increase in EPA and 19% increase in DHA content in erythrocyte phospholipids following a low omega-6 diet for 12 weeks. Uh, since erythrocytes have longer half-life than plasma phospholipids, a four-week period of dietary linoleic acid lowering may be insufficient to produce any changes in tissue omega-3 status in erythrocyte phospholipids. They then go on to state that reducing linoleic acid intake to approximately 2% of total energy in the U.S. trial would be expected to produce a proportionally greater increase in the omega-3 long-chain PUFA status due to a more pronounced reduction in competition for esterification into membrane phospholipids and a conversion of omega-3 ALA to EPA and DHA. So the other thing that they were pointing there, the other uh, kind of factor that they think would have affected the plasma phospho or the erythrocyte phospholipids further would have been if there was a greater decrease in linoleic acid intake, like the other study that they referenced, which is the McIntosh study. And so this was a study uh, titled Low Omega-6 and Low Omega-6 Plus High Omega-3 Diets for Use in Clinical Research. It's a 2014 study by McIntosh, and this was the study that they mentioned where just decreasing the omega-6s without any increase in omega-3 led to a major increase in omega-3 in the red blood cell phospholipids. EPA increased by 51% and DHA by 19%. So with these couple of studies, we can say pretty convincingly that if we just reduced omega-6s in the diet, we're going to see an increase in omega-3s in the fatty acids in the blood. And the, uh, and the erythrocyte phospholipids. And so 
again, as we're, as I think we've kind of said it multiple times here, this is a huge possible factor that's not accounted for in these uh, original correlational studies. Yeah, another piece that I want to add here, it's actually something I think they discuss discuss inside this Macintosh paper, is that, so we, you're looking at red blood cell phospholipids. So there may be a question, okay, what happens with tissue phospholipids with omega-6 and omega-3? There's essentially, what they talk about in the paper is that since the fat stores of the human body does contain a decent amount of, particularly the Western human, <laughs> contains a de decent amount of <laughs> omega-6, there may be a longer period of time of having to maintain a low omega-6 diet in order to fully, not necessarily fully deplete, but to, to minimize the amount of omega-6 that you have inside the, the phospholipids of different tissues. So red blood cell, liver, muscle, heart, etc. So it may take a little bit more time just because the, the omega-6 polyunsaturated fatty acids can store inside the adipose tissue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's a great point. And what does happen is there's constant remodeling. So if there's a change in, in polyunsaturated fat intake, and even if it starts to change in the phospholipids, those phospholipid fatty acids get replaced by triglycerides that are being released or fatty acids being released by the adipose tissue or by the liver, as you were saying. And so that's why it takes longer is you have to deplete really the whole body stores of these fatty acids in order to really make a change, which takes time. So there's another confounding variable, but a new one that we haven't mentioned, which is just, it, it's just the fact, and this is actually acknowledged by Harris, one of these studies is by Harris, that diet is not the only thing that influences the omega-3 content uh, variability of the phospholipids. There's a handful of other things, and in reality, diets really only account for about 25% of the variability. Another one that accounts for anywhere from 25 to 65% of the variability is heritability uh, as a genetic component or some sort of, of passed down, uh, passed down uh, change or, or shift in propensity for different uh, phospholipid compositions. Do you want to uh, share these studies? Or do you want me to go through them? Um, I mean, the, the first one is a pretty simple one. So the title of this one, Clinical Correlates and Heritability of Erythrocyte Icosapentaenoic and docosahexaenoic acid content in the Framingham Heart Study. So this one's by Harris. So the icosapentaenoic is just EPA, and then the docosahexaenoic is DHA. Those are the long chain omega threes that you get from fish oil. These are the main ones that we were actually really looking at. Um, and basically, the quote from the study says the total explained variability in the omega three index for the fully adjusted model was 73%, which included major components due to her heritability, which is about 24%, then EPA plus DHA intake, which is about 25%, and fish oil supplementation, which is about 15%. So what they're basically so showing here is they, they looked at a statistical model to determine what percent of the omega-3 fatty acid composition of red blood cell phospholipids was determined by different factors, including heritability, EPA and DHA intake, which is probably a fish oil supplement, and then, uh, or no, actually fish intake. And then they also looked at fish oil supplementation. And what they're showing here is that heritability accounted for about 24% of the variability in the uh, omega 3 phospholipid content of red blood cells. Um, and then the EPA and DHA intake from the diet, what we're assuming the diet, accounted for about 25%. And then fish oil supplementation actually accounted for about 15%. So this isn't to say that fish oil or fish intake doesn't actually change red blood cell omega-3 phospholipid content, because it definitely does. It's just not the only driver of what's going on inside the red blood cell uh, phospholipid omega-3 content. So there's heritability. And then with uh, some of the other fatty acids, there's also changes in metabolic in different uh, metabolic states, particularly saturated and monounsaturated fatty acids. And we'll get to it in a bit, but we can also talk about what happens with oxidative stress. So there's multiple factors that are working on the omega-3, the, the phospholipid composition, the omega-3 content of the phospholipids for not only red blood cells, but plasma phospholipids and then also phospholipids throughout the body. And they're dependent upon, we already mentioned omega-6 to omega-3 intake, now we're talking about heritability. We know diet we, and fish oil supplementation are able to change them. 
And then we'll continue to go down the line and talk about some of these other things. And the reason we're getting into this, just to put the context here, is that you're seeing the association that red blood cell omega-3s are associated with decreased mortality. So we're saying, okay, what else besides eating fatty fish and taking fish oil supplements actually changes the red blood cell omega-3 content? And these are all of the different factors or some of the different factors that are possible and that can explain what's going on and and, and what's adjusting that red blood cell omega-3 content. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't think there was anything in that study by Harris looking at omega-6 intake. So that is another thing. When we see that correlation earlier from that physician study, looking at EPA, DHA intake and fish oil supplementation with the amount of omega-6s, that could be another confounding variable. So there might be a bit of an overestimate there as far as just omega-3 intake and fish oil affecting these things without the consideration of omega-6s. Uh, but yeah, definitely good to have that context there. And then there is another study that was suggesting a bit of a higher uh, uh, percentage of variability being accounted for by heritability. And the study title is Familial Aggregation of Red Blood Cell Membrane Fatty Acid Composition, the Kibbutzim Family Study. And they have a quote stating, we estimated that polygenes explained 40 to 70% of the sex and age adjusted inter individual variability in all red blood cell fatty acids, saturated, monounsaturated, and polyunsaturated. The heritability estimates remained very similar after further adjustments for smoking, alcohol consumption, physical activity, lipoproteins, body mass index, waist to hip ratio, education, and religiosity. And so, what they found in specific looking at the omega 3s was that the total omega 3 content, they found it to be up to 66% due to her heritability for DHA, 65%, EPA was 52%, but total omega-3s was 66%, including the others, which is a pretty high amount due to heritability. It is worth mentioning, uh, as you were saying earlier, Mike, that they did not control for diet in the study. However, two things to note there. One is they explained in the study why that is, that there's generally very similar diets between the people there, and they did have some considerations there. Uh, because of the the nature of the study, they're all eating largely the same things, eating in the same place. And the other factor as well is when we're looking at the original correlational data, they didn't look at diet either. So considering heritability in the context of not looking at diet isn't such a, like this might be a more accurate figure in terms of the representation of those original observational studies by Harris. Maybe up to 66% of the variability is actually due to heritability and not the amount of uh, of omega-3s that are consumed or other things. So just, again, something to consider. Not a reason to throw out the studies, but just among these other things, context to to keep in mind. Yeah, I would say that it, the heritability piece probably falls somewhere between that low end of the spectrum and the high end of the spectrum because there's a multi, there's like multiple you things. You mean the 25 between, and the 66%? The yeah, 25 between being the 25 end. and 66, yeah. yeah. Uh, just because it's like, it's hard to, and you'll see this even in the association studies that are showing this beneficial effect of an increased omega-3 content in red blood cells is you can't control for everything. And so there's mm -hmm. a lot of confounding factors that make it really difficult. And like that's one of the first ones we discussed is the healthy user bias, which is one of the most difficult things to control for because you have to use a lot of proxy markers for that because there's not really like it's very there's not really a metric currently that exists to be like uh, are you like are you somebody who tries to take care of your health or not um and a lot of times when the association studies they're unable to parse it out so that's something to keep in mind but heritability does play a piece omega-6 content plays a piece and then what i think we're going to get into in just a second is that oxidative stress also plays a piece inside what's going on with the uh, omega-3 content of phospholipids yeah, yeah. And that was something that Harris mentioned in that same study looking at heritability. So the same study titled Clinical Correlates and Heritability of Erythrocyte, Icosa Pentanoic, and uh, Doco Docosa Hexanoic. Thank you. Docosa hex Hexanoic Acid, EPA and DHA content in the Framingham Heart Study. They do. He does mention that another factor here is general oxidative stress. And this is an important one. He states that in a previous study, lower levels of EPA and DHA were associated with higher levels of pro-oxidants in red blood cells from obese subjects and with higher levels of inflammatory markers, suggesting that increased adiposity, oxidative stress, and inflammation, and lower membrane omega-3 fatty acids appear to coexist. So there's a relationship here. 
not necessarily causative. It's hard to say what's causing what, but we'll get into this in a moment, that if you have higher oxidative stress and that is creating lipid peroxidation, those fatty acids will be removed from the phospholipids. And so another potential confounding variable here is that when you have higher omega-3 fatty acids in your red blood cell phospholipids, it's a sign of low oxidative stress over time. And of course, we know that that is something that will contribute to improved outcomes, improved lifespan, reduced mortality. So, And so he does acknowledge that in this other paper. And there's a couple other papers that uh, also suggest a potential causative relationship here. This is one looking at rats. And the title is Enhanced Level of Omega-3 Fatty Acid in Membrane Phospholipids Induces Lipid Peroxidation in Rats Fed Dietary uh, doco, docos, Docosahexanoic <laughs> Acid Oil. <laughs> Doco, docosahexanoic, so DHA oil. Uh, we'll be referencing this study later because it shows what happens when there's higher levels of omega-3s and phospholipids for an animal's lifetime. But this is just looking at, uh, this quote is just exploring what happens when the higher levels of omega-3s are exposed to oxidation or oxidative stress. And so it says, figure six shows the loss of omega-3 and omega-6 PUFA in microsomes during peroxidation initiated by a combination of NADPH and iron and ADP. Uh, both DHA and arachidonic acid were consumed during the 40-minute incubation. The change in the loss of PUFA levels was bigger in the omega-3 fatty acid than in the omega-6 fatty acid after exposure to microsomes of microsomes to oxidative stress. So what they're saying is that if the phospholipids get exposed to oxidative stress, there is a greater loss of omega-3s, which are generally more susceptible to oxidative stress over the omega-6 counterparts. Uh, so there's a greater loss of omega-3s than omega-6s. So if you're seeing low levels of omega-3s in phospholipids, then that could be a sign of high oxidative stress. It might have nothing to do with the amount that's consumed. And then vice versa, if you have high levels, it might have nothing to do with the amount that's consumed. It might just be caused by low oxidative stress. And there is one more study here that also uh, alludes to this. The title is Incorporation of Marine Lipids into Mitochondrial Membranes Increases Susceptibility to Damage by Calcium in Reactive Oxygen Species, Evidence for Enhanced Activation of Phospholipase A2 in Mitochondria Enriched with Omega-3 Fatty Acids. We'll be coming back to this study later as well, but it is also relevant here when we're talking about the influence of oxidative stress on membrane composition or phospholipid composition. And it states that dietary fish oils were readily incorporated into mitochondrial membranes, Exposure to calcium and reactive oxygen species enhanced the release of polyunsaturated fatty acids enriched at the SN2 position of phospholipids from mitochondria of fish oil-fed rats when compared uh, with similarly treated mitochondria of beef tallow-fed rats. The results indicate that phospholipase A2 is activated in mitochondria exposed to calcium and reactive oxygen species and is responsible, at least in part, for the impairment of respiratory function, something we'll talk about later. Phospholipase A2 activity and mitochondrial damage are enhanced when mitochondrial membranes are enriched with omega-3 fatty acids. So what we have here, again, is a mechanism through which we are removing the fatty acids when they are exposed to oxidative stress, and this happens more so with the omega-3s. Again, providing evidence, providing support for the impact here of oxidative stress in the remodeling or the changing of the composition of phospholipids. Yeah, and just... On a, on a, there's a, quite a few other studies discussing changes in red blood cell fatty acid composition and then also adjustments in lipid peroxidation products inside red blood cells in different disease states. So you have them in obesity and people who are overweight. You have them in people who have metabolic syndrome and coronary artery disease. There's studies showing increased uh, lipid peroxidation an adjustment of red blood cell lipids in people with cervical cancer or women with cervical cancer. Then you have it again, multiple studies discussing coronary artery disease. So at, uh, another study here talking about hypertensive and normal tensive patients, and then men with type 2 diabetes and the, and the effects on red blood cell phospholipids during exercise. So basically what you're seeing in a lot of these studies is if you have healthy people, they are able to maintain the polyunsaturated fatty acids inside their phospholipids of their red blood cells and other tissues, not because they're eating tons of fish oil, but more so because the fish oil or the omega-3s that they have present inside the, the phospholipids aren't being damaged by the high levels of oxidative stress. So when you have situations where you have 
somebody who has heart disease or as cervical cancer or as hypertension or as diabetes or as obese, all of those states are in general characterized by increased levels of oxidative stress. And you can kind of think of oxidative stress as the fuse. And then the, the highly unsaturated polyunsaturated fats are the, um, are basically the like the, well, right? the, the, the oxidative fatty stress acids is the, are the fuse and, and the, no, the oxidative, oxidative stress, stress is, the, is the fuse. And then the fatty acids are kind of like the dynamite, right? Cause you have the oxidative stress input. And then when it, when you get the fatty, when it interacts with the fatty acids, it causes all the damage to lipid peroxides. And then those trigger the whole inflammatory cascade. So the omega sixes do, and then also the omega threes trigger the production of all these inflammatory mediators. Some of the omega three ones have anti-inflammatory effects. There's there's differences amongst the different ones, but overall, you get a bunch of lipid peroxidation, you get a bunch of inflammatory mediators, and then you also get remodeling of the structures because you can't maintain an oxidized lipid inside the phospholipid membrane because it disorganizes the membrane. The membrane is not able to function well, and we I guess we'll get into this in a little bit, but when or what Jay just kind of mentioned is in the mitochondria, it's a very specialized structure that has multiple membranes and the membranes are there to create gradients so that you can produce energy. If you start disrupting those membranes with a bunch of polyunsaturated fatty acids, you impair that energy production. So not only do you have damage to the energy producing uh, organelles or organs of the cell, you have um, like an, an ability to produce that energy as well, which leads to further issues down the line. So oxidative stress plus unsaturated fatty acids are a recipe for <laughs> an explosion of inflammation and chronic disease, et cetera. So, yeah. 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 Maybe we could say oxidative stress lights the fuse and the, fu the unsaturated fats are both the fuse and the dynamite. <laughs> that's, a, that's what was <laughs> tripping me up. Either way, I, yeah. I think the point gets across. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great point. And I do want to mention, even though they did control for disease states in those correlational data, Independent of that, if you looked at oxidative stress levels among all people, so if you look at the oxidative stress levels of somebody within a disease state, uh, generally the ones with fewer oxidative stress will be better within that disease state. And if you look at healthy people, same thing, the ones who have less oxidative stress will be in a better health state. So despite the fact that they controlled for that, this would still be a, a kind of variable that would exist throughout all of these, uh, all of these populations when controlling for those things and would still be a huge confounder because it would be a major thing that affects the composition of those phospholipids. So, yeah, I, th I think it's a really important one. And uh, yeah, uh, the, last, uh, the last of the confounding variables that I had to mention here, which brings us to all of the kind of data, both some observational, epidemiological, but also some interventional in different species, including humans, that conflicts with the idea that just consuming more omega-3s to increase the omega-3 levels of the phospholipids is beneficial and leads to improved lifespan and improved health outcomes. Uh, because that's, yeah, the, that's beyond all the possible confounding variables, all the possible issues with the correlational data, we want to consider all the other data out there and whether this actually fits with it. And so uh, I think what we'll find is that it generally doesn't. Yeah, and there's huge paradoxes in you're seeing this benefit in this association study, and then you run a bunch of mechanistic studies, and you're seeing you know incorporation of tons of omega threes just shredding animals, shredding cells, and then you're seeing associations on other sides across, as we're going to get into right now, across different species, and then even within species that changes in the uh, the omega three content and the unsaturated fat content of the membranes causes huge problems in metabolic function and lifespan and oxidative stress. So that's mm -hmm. it. You have some, you have multiple pieces, you have multiple signals that you're looking at and you have to, instead of zooming in on this one association study in humans, say, oh, there it is. I just need to have more omega threes. It's like, wait, well, what about all this other stuff where we see this problem? Like essentially there's no paradoxes. There's not a, there's mm -hmm. not a paradox that exists. It's just, we don't have all the information yet, or we haven't fully elucidated what the mechanism is on one side. And so for us, we're trying to sit here and we're trying to say, okay, well, we have this seemingly huge discrepancy where in this animal data, there's this, we're seeing the and omega threes cause, and human data, we're seeing omega threes and fish oil supplementation causing problems. But then you also see some associations and some benefits in other studies. So what could explain all of this? How, where are we? Where can we find this this lacking piece, this missing piece that 
solves the equation for us. Yeah. And even before that, if there's all this conflicting data and all these confounding variables, variables and all of these other actual interventional studies, how can we possibly say confidently that based on this association, we should be consuming more omega-3s? That's, that's really the, the thing that we're getting to here is just that question. And so the, the next piece, as far as looking at this other data that I want to get into, is looking at the levels of omega-3s in membrane phospholipids across species and how that is associated with shorter lifespans, faster aging, and as you said, not only across species, but also within species. And this, uh, this is going to involve referencing quite a bit of research from A.J. Holbert, who we've referenced quite a few times prior, especially in previous uh, episodes talking about the polyunsaturated fats. And uh, yeah, he's got some great work looking into this, but we'll also reference some other people as well. So in his paper titled On the Importance of Fatty Acid Composition of Membranes for Aging, he looks at this relationship between species, and he states that the allometric equations describing these relationships show that a 24% decrease in the peroxidation index of liver mitochondrial phospholipids and a 19% decrease in the peroxidation index of skeletal phospholipids is associated with the doubling of lifespan. This is just, he, he's, uh, and I'll explain, a, or I'll include a figure here in a moment, a graph that kind of shows this, but he's basically saying there's a direct relationship between the peroxidizability index, which is how unsaturated the membranes are, how susceptible they are to peroxidation, and lifespan. And just a 24% decrease in the peroxidation index of liver mitochondrial phospholipids and a 90%, 19% decrease in the peroxidation index of skeletal muscle phospholipids is associated with a doubling of lifespan. This is a huge difference. We're not talking about like, oh, this might be associated with a small change in lifespan or something. This is this is massive when we look at this across species and like to the point where you can't ignore it. Uh, do you have anything to add before I share the uh, the graphs here? I just think it's funny because when you look at a lot of the other association studies where they're looking with omega threes and RBC phospholipids and whatnot, they're only they're they're talking about much smaller percentages, like what is it like eight percent or six percent or something around there. Whereas when you're mm -hmm. you start looking at the Holbert stuff, you're seeing no. 200% increases in lifespan or <laughs> so it's like it's just a massive massive difference and some uh, a signal that's kind of hard to avoid paying attention to and it's important I think it's very important to kind of determine you know where does the where does the reality of the situation lie between these two somewhat seemingly conflicting pieces of data yeah yeah, no, it's a great point. And to put the numbers in context, that one paper was assuming like this massive, you know, the difference between consuming as much or not consuming, sorry, the difference between having as much omega threes, like the highest quintile versus the lowest, the difference was two years. If you're assuming an 80 year lifespan, that's two and a half percent, which is not nothing. I'm not, I mean, that's big when it comes to that sort of data. But as you're saying, to totally on a different scale when we're looking at peroxidizability index across species. And so we see that line drawn very clearly here when looking at this figure from that paper, which is looking at the peroxidizability index of phospholipids and lifespan. And we've got maximum lifespan on the x-axis and peroxidation index on the y-axis. The left is a graph of skeletal muscle phospholipids and the right is liver mitochondrial phospholipids. And you see a very clear line. And if you look into Holbert's other research, looking at the membrane pacemaker theory of aging, he talks about how these lines fit better than anything else, way better than the rate of living theory or oxidative stress theory. There's all of these exceptions to those rules that come from certain types of birds, that come from naked mole rats, and all of those are accounted for when looking at the peroxidizability index. So it's a really good fit for, uh, for an explanation of why certain species live longer than others, fits better than anything else. And you see it very clearly here that as the uh, peroxidation index decreases, maximum lifespan of the species increases. Uh, and again, this is looking at phospholipids and different tissues. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the associations speak strongly for themselves, particularly when you start to look at, so you look where humans fall on the index and you're starting to see at the 100 year lifespan, peroxidation index is at the absolute bottom compared to all of the other organisms present. And so yeah. just to, just I want to put this in context for people so that they can understand what's going on. So inside your cell membranes, 
particularly around uh, th- this is looking at liver mitochondria and then skeletal muscle phospholipids. So essentially, the membranes that are around the skeletal muscle cells and then all and then that are around the mitochondria of the liver are it, what they're showing here is that if you have less polyunsaturated, particularly highly unsaturated polyunsaturated fatty acids within the membranes of these different cells, you actually live longer. And so what explains this? So what is peroxidation? Peroxidation is the, the da- is damage to lipids. So essentially the lipids get interacted with, with re- reactive oxygen species. So these components that can kind of degrade the lipid structure a bit, and then there's a chain reactions that happen from there. And so when you load your membranes up, when you load the cells membranes, the cell structure up with these types of fats, the cells are very liable to be damaged by different things that can cause this oxidative stress. It's kind of like if you have a little fire in all these places, everything is flammable because of these type of fats. You basically have a bunch of fuses all over the place with these different types of fats. So when you're, what you're seeing here is that if you have less fuses present inside and incorporated into the structure of the cell, you're less likely to set the cell on fire and you're also uh, seemingly le- light, more likely to live longer because you have less cellular damage over time in response to these unsaturated fats. So you're essentially, you're saying if I build my structure with better materials, the structure will last a lot longer. That's essentially what we're seeing here. And that's the general idea to, to kind of think about these things in. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a great point. Uh, Really great context to keep in mind. Another factor, too, that's just worth mentioning very briefly, and again, we've discussed in previous episodes and articles and things, is that the membrane saturation not only affects the susceptibility to peroxidation, but it also affects the efficiency of respiration. So when you have more of the unsaturated fats, it makes these membranes more permeable to ions and less, which alone wastes energy if you're losing sodium you know, if that's leaving the cell and then you have to pump it back in, so to speak, and all of that, uh, that or pump it out and then it's coming back in, all, you know, all of those things require a huge or will dramatically affect the efficiency of how well our cells are functioning on an energetic level. And it also affects how well we actually produce ATP because the more permeable those membranes are to protons, which is affected by peroxidizability index, the less efficiently we can produce ATP. And so that's another reason why the ones that the species that have lower lifespans and higher peroxidation index also have a much higher quote metabolic rate per like based on body weight. It's not because they are producing energy really efficiently and they've got all this ATP. It's the opposite. It's that they're much less efficient in terms of their ability to produce ATP. They have to waste energy on things like pumping things, pumping ions back and forth, and they aren't able to produce that ATP as well. And so that is why they actually have these quote higher metabolic rates that are just much more wasteful and ending up with much, you know, to get the equivalent ATP, it requires way more potential energy, way more substrate. And that is also not ideal. So that's another thing to consider that uh, in addition to peroxidation, when it comes to looking at the phospholipid composition. Yeah, I just want to use some analogies to kind of explain some of those things a bit. But so for example, for the sodium potassium pump or like the the movement of ions across the cell, you can kind of think of that as like heating or cooling in your house. If you live in a really, so say you're living in Ecuador and it's really nice and hot in Ecuador and you're cooling your house down, but your walls are terribly insulated. So you're just, all the air conditioning you're doing, it's just, it's just, it's all the heat is coming right back in. So you have to spend more and more and more energy to keep your house cool. That's kind of what you're seeing with the cells when the walls of the cells are made with these unsaturated fats. But and the way you can the way you can kind of visualize this as well is that if you had a bottle of, let's say, corn oil, right, it's liquid. Whereas if you had a bunch of butter, the butter is usually very solid, at, at least if it's not at certain certain temperatures. And so if you're when you start building the walls of the cells out of these very liquid fats, it it makes the walls kind of leaky, allows things to go out. And so that's kind of what we're seeing when you're talking about just the waste of these ions. And then the other thing is, if, another analogy to think about this as a car is, if you had fuel going into the car and you're, you're, you're burning that fuel to produce this energy, what winds up happening is in the, in an engine that has a whole bunch of but that's built out of these highly unsaturated fats. What winds up happening is some of the fuel, when it gets into the engine, 
the engine burns it, but there's so much release of the heat and smoke and whatnot, and it's not a clean burning engine that can just direct it purely into mechanical energy. A lot of it is just being released as heat and smoke and whatnot because the the structure of the engine is not sound enough to maintain all of the energy that's being produced. So you have multiple problems when you incorporate a lot of these unsaturated fats in the membrane. It makes the actual structure of the cell quite leaky. And then the other thing that uh, the other couple of things that we mentioned is that it uh, the the energy that's being produced is able to leak out, and then all the contents of the cell, the the interior components of the cell, aren't able to stay inside the cell because the walls are leaky. And then the cells are also more likely to be damaged. The walls are more likely to be damaged. They're they're made of tinder. They can it, you you have this engine made of tinder, and you you're running uh, fuel through it, and it's heating up, and then it's setting the walls on fire. So that's you're seeing those kind of three things going on when you incorporate tons of unsaturated fatty acids into the actual uh, structure of the cell and the mitochondria. Yeah, yeah, and I've I've included this diagram here showing that just you know as as just to go along with their analogies, which are really helpful, just showing that when you have the phospholipid bilayer with more unsaturated fats, it's much more permeable. Things can cross through much easier. And that's because you've got all these kinks in there and it's, you know, all the less stability, it leads to the liquid versus solid, everything you were discussing. So all great points to consider there. When it comes to coming back to this, this data, looking at phospholipid composition and lifespan and everything, this is looking, so, so far we just have this data looking between species. And what's important to keep in mind when we're looking between species is that all, the composition there is a set point with each species where you're generally going to have around the same phospholipid composition within a certain variability, uh, but it's largely going to be very, very similar. Within that set point, you can then have, or like a set range, you can then have variability based on things like diet and genetic things or heritability within the species. So when we're looking at this earlier data that we were talking about, looking at heritability, looking at you know what accounts for the variability, that is all within the species of just looking at what accounts for what changes within species. But when you look between species, it's largely kind of a constant. And that's important to keep in mind. But then what we can look at next, as you mentioned, is what happens within a species when you do create that variability. So you have one species, we already know compared to the others. Yes, it'll have a lower lifespan if it has more unsaturated fats. But what about, what about within the species, the ones that have more versus less unsaturated fats or a higher peroxidizability index? So you're saying what happens if we take a rat? What if we take two rats, the same exact species of rat? Maybe this, maybe they're brother and sister rats, but one, one rat is fed a diet that's very unsaturated. And so their membranes go to that more highly unsaturated or more peroxidizable set point of the or uh, peroxidizability. And then you have another rat, the sister rat, say, and she gets fed, or maybe it's another brother, right? Because two males, we want to keep everything the same. So the other brother gets fed a really saturated diet or a diet at least that doesn't have a ton of polyunsaturated fat. So the peroxidizability of their membranes is kept very low. Is there any change in lifespan? That's basically what we want to see. Exactly. Yep. And we will be going into that later, but we at least see some proxies for it here in this study. And they look at quite a few different things in terms of longevity, not just general peroxidizability index, but specifically DHA, which is very important. DHA is one of the main long chain omega-3 fatty acids that's pointed to as beneficial. And so we, they actually compare that to linoleic acid of the omega-6s. So we'll, we'll dig into that. It's, uh, it's really telling when we look at the, that data. So the title of this paper is Membrane Fatty Acid Unsaturation, Protection Against Oxidative Stress and Maximum Lifespan a homeoviscous longevity adaptation. And the kind of summarizing quote states that aging is a progressive and universal process originating endogenously that manifests during post-maturational life. Available comparative evidence supporting the mitochondrial free radical theory of aging consistently indicates that two basic molecular traits are associated with the rate of aging and thus with maximum lifespan. The presence of low rates of mitochondrial uh, oxygen radical production and low degrees of fatty acid unsaturation of cellular membranes and post-mitotic tissues of long-lived uh, homeothermic vertebrates in relation to those of short-lived ones. So what they're basically saying is they are pointing to two major factors that determine lifespan. One is how much reactive oxygen species are produced, and two is what is the degree of fatty acid unsaturation of the membranes. 
So they depict this clearly uh, in each of these figures. Figure two is looking at fossil lipid saturation and lifespan in different tissues. And so what we have here on the left, we're just looking at, uh, these are all looking at different species, but essentially what we see is that the greater the polyunsaturation or the unsaturation of the phospholipids, the shorter the lifespan. And so they compare, for example, rats and pigeons with rats having a maximum lifespan of four years and pigeons of 35 years being dramatically different of, despite being very similar sized and similar metabolic rate, more or less, you know, th just as a more explanatory variable as opposed to just body size. Uh, they do the same thing with looking at mice, canary, and parakeets, and also showing that despite a difference in dietary composition of phospholipids, there's a maintenance of the phospholipid composition of the membranes and the heart, in this case, they're looking at. Despite, so basically, despite the fact that parakeets eat more polyunsaturated fats, they actually have lower polyunsaturated fats in their membranes. This is because of what I had discussed, where you have a relatively constant set range, and that that is way more associated with, uh, with lifespan. So for example, parakeets have their maximum lifespan of 21 years compared to mice of about three and a half years. And then on the right, we just have a few different data points here. Of course, the, the data points in that uh, Holbert study were, was much more comprehensive, but here just showing the difference or comparing longevity and the polyunsaturation between the liver mitochondria of phospholipids of humans, pigeons, and rats. Yeah, I mean, I think, at, I think overall it's, it's relatively explanatory with the images. So basically humans having less... So here, the, instead of peroxidizability index, they're doing double bond index. So the polyunsaturated... Mm -hmm. When you have a fat, what determines how peroxidizable it is is how much double bonds that there are in the fatty acid chain. And so the more double bonds you have, the more unsaturated the fat, and the more likely it is to be peroxidized or damaged by those reactive oxygen species. So humans having the lowest amount of unsaturated fats inside their liver mitochondria have the longest longevity compared to rat and pigeon. And pigeon being uh, kind of halfway between humans and rat in terms of the double bond index of their liver mitochondria actually have a halfway or a, a, a moderate lifespan closer to that 35 years, I think you said 35, 40 years. So th that's all that this is showing. And the other thing that you pointed out very specifically is that the membrane composition between these different organisms is maintained within a particular set point. So even though an organism can eat more polyunsaturated fatty acids, they're, they're still going to maintain their the compositions of their mem membranes within a particular range. So even if the rat mm -hmm. eats 50 grams of, of linoleic acid per day, and then the bird eats 50 grams of linoleic acid per day, the bird will still have lower linoleic acid content inside the, mem the phospholipids, the membranes of its cells, just because the, the cells themselves are controlling what that composition is with, within a certain range. Right. Yeah, exactly. And this was even looking at a diet in parakeets that had higher double bond index uh, relative to the mice yet had much lower in the phospholipids. So, yeah. And uh, before yeah. you continue, just another point from the initial quote. So they mentioned two pieces or two points that were important. It was not only, it was the double bond index, and then it was also how much reactive oxygen species or oxygen products were produced by the mitochondria. And again, those go hand in hand because those species that are produced by the mitochondria, you can kind of think of it as like smoke. That's what damages the unsaturated fatty acids. So if you have an organism that has a low amount of polyunsaturated fats in its membrane, and then it has a very low amount of ox oxygen species produced, it'll live a very long time. But if you have an, on the flip side, if you have an animal that has a lot of unsaturated fats and produces a lot of oxygen species, it's probably not going to live very long. And again, it's related to those oxygen species attacking the unsaturated fats in the membrane and then causing basically destruction of the cellular structure. So you have two different scenarios that you're looking at there. So you're, th that's just context overall for what we're discussing here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. In this next figure, they also show, so you're mentioning, oh, they also were talking about reactive oxygen species and that relationship. So in this next figure, or these next four figures, really, they look at that. They looked at the phospholipid saturation and lipid peroxidation and compare both of those to lifespan. So in the top left here, you see that this is with a lot more data points. 
looking at the double bond index and longevity. On the top right here, we have in vivo lipid peroxidation and longevity showing the same curve. Bottom left is in vitro lipid peroxidation and longevity. And then in the bottom right, we have the actual measurement of a lipid peroxide uh, marker, malondialdehyde, in this case bound with lysine, and looking at that in longevity. And so in all of these cases, you see a very clear curve where if there's less lipid peroxidation, less propensity to it, and less markers of it, you have greater longevity and vice versa. Yeah. And I mean, it's not surprising, right? It kind of makes sense. If if you if life is dependent upon the cells and the cell structure is being damaged on a continual basis and there's a heavy turnover over a long period of time, then it, it's likely that that organism is probably not going to live as long. So this actually makes a lot of sense overall when you start to think about these things, you know, even with your car, if you have if your car is constantly breaking down, it's constantly having problems, you're probably not going to get a full lifespan out of the car versus if the car, you know, you don't have any accidents, the engine's running fine, all this type of stuff. So it's, it, it, it makes sense in like even common sense terms, like, you know, without all the research terms, you can still think about it in terms of, and for me, when I'm reading through the papers, I'm thinking about things, not necessarily in terms of a car, but just the general idea of if I have this structure that's being, that's really easily damaged. And then I have this 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 uh, engine in the cell that can produce this damage. Well, that's not really a good recipe for gen for overall function. On the flip side, if the engine is clean clean running, and then the cell is a very sturdy structure, well, I'm, I'm probably going to be less likely to have problems in the long run. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and they then test this out by having a couple different groups of rats. One that they feed. Uh, 10% of their whole diet from fish oil and the other that they feed 10% of their diet, well, 9.5% from coconut oil, it's hydrogenated and a little bit of corn oil. Uh, the reason why they actually feed the corn oil is to prevent the production of meat acid, which is an omega-9 fatty acid, but uh, that's not uh, something we'll be talking about today. And uh, so this is one of those kind of things that we were discussing is what happens within species. And here they don't actually look at longevity. There are other papers that we'll go over where they do show that you increase omega-3 consumption and it actually is not ideal for longevity in animals. Here they just look at the same markers that they were using that trend exactly with longevity. And so what they found was uh, they looked at the double bond index of the uh, heart mitochondria and they significantly increased with the fish oil group. They then looked at lipid peroxidation levels and found that those significantly increased, dramatically over doubled in the uh, in the fish oil group. And then they looked at the markers of that lipid peroxidation, malondialdehyde and protein carbonyls, and those significantly increased as well in the fish oil group. So these markers that all trended exactly with longevity all were showing much worse outcomes when it came to the fish oil group. And we'll be digging into quite a few studies showing this and also looking exactly at longevity later on. But I just wanted to mention this since we were going through the study. It was just right there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, I don't have too much more to add to this one. It's pretty self-explanatory with the context we've already given. Yeah. And the last figure that's worth going into here is looking specifically at DHA versus linoleic acid. And this is one that I think might be particularly surprising to a lot of people. So Linoleic acid, which is one of the main omega-6s that's normally looked at, is less susceptible to peroxidation than DHA is, significantly less. I want to say it's like two times less uh, susceptible, which is a big difference, you know, 200%. So they, they then look at linoleic acid levels uh, in the phospholipids of different species, and this is all looking at heart phospholipids versus lifespan, and then they look at DHA levels, the main omega-3, in heart phospholipids of these eight mammalian species and, and look at that with longevity. And you see, again, very, very strong, not only clear correlations, but with the DHA, it's actually logarithmic. So <laughs> when you have dramatically more DHA levels, it shortens the lifespan dramatically. And then as you decrease toward near zero, that's where you start to get really high lifespans. The amount of DHA levels, in, in this case, looking at heart, phospho heart phospholipids, uh, trend to be very, very low in long-lived species. And when you compare that with linoleic acid, it's actually the opposite, where higher levels of linoleic acid in the uh, membranes are associated with increased longevity across species. Now, again, this is not talking about 
you take a one species and you feed them really high omega-6s versus not high omega-6s, is that beneficial? That's a different question. We talked about that, how if you have, let's say omega-3s are the same and you have high versus low omega-6 diet, the low omega-6 diet will probably be better because omega-6s themselves are harmful and that will actually increase the DHA to a quote normal level for that species. But again, we, we kind of discussed that. I just wanted to show the the general trend here, which I think would be uh, unexpected to most people. Yeah, and I think that the higher linoleic acid content that you're seeing here in this diet is a, a function of there's going to be a set amount of polyunsaturated fatty acids inside the the membrane phospholipid composition. And so this is basically just saying you don't have a ton of omega-3s or highly unsaturated uh, uh, uns, uh, polyunsaturated fats. You just have right. like... A, a, and the reason I so just for context, linoleic acid, I think, has two double bonds, whereas DHA, I think, has six. And as I mentioned, the more Correct. double yeah. bonds that you have overall, the more likely that fat is, the more unstable it is, the more likely it is to get damaged. So with the you have with if you had a membrane that was if you had a membrane that had a bunch more linoleic acid than DHA, even though it had the more linoleic acid, it would still be less susceptible to oxidative stress. There's also something that Holbert talks about that's pretty interesting is it, it, I forget the specific numbers, but essentially if you had, say the membrane had, the whole membrane was 10 phospholipids. If you had a membrane that had like three or four linoleic acid and then another membrane that only had two, had no linoleic acid, but had two uh, DHA present inside the membrane, the membrane with two DHA would be more likely to to be susceptible to oxidative stress because it is more uh, peroxidizable because of the larger number of double bonds. So I think what you're seeing here is a function of linoleic acid actually just not showing being a marker of not having a whole bunch of other unsaturated fats with more double bonds present. Yeah, yep. Yeah, it's a great point. And I did actually want to make a quick correction to something I said. So it's not linoleic acid is not two times less susceptible uh, arachidonic acid. But linoleic acid, I want to say, is like something more like eight times less susceptible to peroxidation than DHA. So pretty big difference. So you can see that here. Uh, this is from a different paper from Holbert looking at the peroxidation index of different fatty acids. And that 18.2 is the linoleic acid and the 22.6 is the DHA. So yeah, about eight times difference. And when compared to the monounsaturated fats, uh, DHA, which is the 22.6, is 320 times more susceptible to peroxidation. So pretty, pretty dramatic differences. And that is linoleic acid isn't the only difference that accounts for the difference in peroxidation, uh, peroxidation index. The amount of monounsaturated fats is as well. That obviously makes a big difference. Well, as you can see, though, the so the the two columns left of N6 PUFA and N3 PUFA are actually showing they're not empty columns. They are showing the peroxidizability of saturated fatty acids and monounsaturated fatty acids. It's just the monounsaturated and saturated fatty acids are so much less peroxidizable. They don't even factor on the same scale here. Like you need to have a, like ridiculously small units to actually compare them appropriately. Yeah. Yep. So that trend between species looking at lifespan, looking at peroxidation index and the, the correlations there are extremely important to consider, especially when we're just talking association data. I mean, that's, you know, that that I think alone should provide some caution to wanting to increase DHA levels in in phospholipids. Uh, but it, the, I think the next area that's helpful to look at here is looking at what happens when, hum, well, A, what happens when we consume omega-3s? Just we'll show real quick that when we consume more omega-3s, it will increase the omega-3s of the phospholipids. So there's a couple studies just stating that very clearly. Then we'll talk about what happens when we actually consume those omega-3s. What is the outcome? So just real quick, uh, these are pretty short and self-explanatory, uh, but just saying that when we supplement with omega-3s, it does increase the omega-3 levels of phospholipids. The reason this is important is because when we go on to say what happens when we supplement with omega-3s, we can use that as a proxy for increases in omega-3s in the phospholipids, which is the whole question here is, is, is that beneficial? Should we be consuming omega-3s to increase that? So this study is titled Mechanisms by Which Dietary Fatty Acids Regulate Mitochondrial Structure, Function, and Health and Disease. 
And they state that dietary supplementation of EPA or DHA increases the level of omega-3 PUFA acyl chains within mitochondrial membranes, which leads to membrane disorganization and potentially increased electron leakage. Several studies show that an increase in the polyunsaturation of phospholipids, particularly cardiolipin, increases the, the production of ROS. So we get a little bit of a uh, of insight, a little bit of a tease as far as some other things that we'll be t- uh, discussing that happen when you increase the omega-3 content of phospholipids, but they kind of mention it there. And then in this next study, and I'll let you comment, Mike, they are just looking at humans at, at what happens when there's an increase in omega-3 uh, consumption. And they state that fatty, or the title is Fatty Acid Composition of Skeletal Muscle Reflects Dietary Fat Composition in Humans. They state that the proportion of total omega-3 fatty acids in the muscle phospholipids was approximately two and a half times higher with the five times higher proportion of EPA in subjects supplemented with omega-3 fatty acids than in those given placebo. Similar differences were observed in the skeletal muscle trialglycerols. So there's there's a bunch of studies, uh, as we'll get to as well, that look at omega-3 supplementation, and they do mention that it does increase the amount that's in the phospholipids. But I just wanted to include these two just to kind of state that very clearly. Yeah, I, I think the the big question. So we have like kind of two competing situations here, right? So you have one situation where you're showing in animals that if you increase the amount of highly unsaturated fatty acids inside the membrane, then what winds up happening is you have a decrease in lifespan because it leads to increased reactive oxygen species or oxi- or not, or yeah, reactive oxygen species and oxidative stress. But on the flip side, what we talked about initially was that if you, um, like the higher omega-3 content inside the RBC phospholipids, the red blood cell phospholipids, is a function of drastically decreasing or not having a massive intake of omega-6 fatty acids. So they're seemingly like kind of competing components, right? But in reality, I don't think that they're actually uh, massively competing components. And I think what we're going to get into and, and talk about is the... And I think the the modulating factor here is the oxidative stress component overall, and then also the fact that the omega three or the like high amounts of omega six fatty acid consumption is indeed a problem itself. So it's not, and the reason I'm bringing this up and to to be clear about is that you don't. This would be a nail in the coffin for actually taking omega three supplements to increase omega three content of the red blood cell phospholipids. What we're kind of getting at here is that that's probably a bad idea when you keep in mind the negative effects of lipid peroxidation and the effects of these highly unsaturated fatty acids on mitochondrial dynamics and cellular function and then their associations with lifespan. Um, where And then there's other problems with having large amounts of omega-6 fatty acids, which could possibly lead to increased oxidative stress, all these other problems, and then crowd out omega-3s from the membrane. So the ultimate strategy that would make the most sense would be to not have a high amount of omega-3 intake and then also not have a high amount of omega-6 intake altogether and then let the membranes kind of situate themselves appropriately based on, you know, without having these these two influences of effectively managing the dynamics inside the membrane. So it's, it's, it's not a function of having high amounts of fish oil. It's more of a function of not having a high amount of omega-6 and then trying not to like ma- massively increase the unsaturated fatty acids of the membranes overall. I hope that was a little clear. I don't know if you want to clarify it there, but there's like a, it could seem like there's a paradox, but we're we're actually like, there's a narrow point here. There's a specific point here that makes sense and covers the different areas. Yeah, absolutely. And it reminds me, I don't think, so speaking of trying to lower omega-6 and omega-3 intake, not increase omega-3 intake. It reminds me, I don't think we went through that Maasai study prior, right? No, we didn't cover the Maasai study at all. So so that was something I meant to mention when we were talking about the impact of diet on red blood cell uh, phospholipid fatty acid composition. So I actually want to go back to that real quick because it's pretty telling. It's like a very clear, uh, uh, yeah, it makes a huge impact and very clearly describes what we were discussing, where this can just be an effect of lowering omega-6s. And we'll be coming back to the Maasai later, but just to come back to this, so this is a study titled High Content of Long-Chain Omega-3 Polyunsaturated Fatty Acids in Red Blood Cells of Kenyan Maasai Despite Low Dietary Intake. 
And so the first quote here describes uh, their diet versus the uh, amount of fatty acids in the red blood cells. They state that fat consumed, which was 30% of the total diet, was high in saturated fat, about 64%, and low in PUFA, about 9%. Long chain omega 3s made up only 0.15% of the ingested fatty acids, but 5.9% of red blood cell fatty acids. So that is. That, that's huge to show that there is so much higher. And we talked about, I mean, it's kind of relevant to what we're describing. There's a set point here that will maintain some amount of these different phospholipids or these different fatty acids in the phospholipids despite dietary intake. And in this case, what they point to, which we'll get at, is that it's actually the low omega-6 that's the biggest contributor here. And that's because they only consumed 0.15% of their total diet was the long-chain fatty acids their total omega-3s was 0.99%, about 1%. And so the last quote that they state is, is, uh, they state, finally, due to the competitive effects of omega-6 and omega-3 PUFA, a low intake of omega-6 PUFA, mainly linoleic acid, as seen in the diet of the Maasai, was about 1.7%, could be of advantage for omega-3 long-chain PUFA metabolism. So basically suggesting if Regardless of omega-3 intake, if we just consume low amounts of omega-6s, specifically low amounts of linoleic acid, it will maintain a higher amount of omega-3 in the phospholipids. So when we're so when we're talking about correlation in those original studies, this is huge, right? This is a huge confounding variable where we can just use that omega-3 index as a marker of how much omega-6 someone's consuming. Yeah, exactly. And so this I think is this is helpful for me to clarify the point is that. The mem the, because we have a specific set point for the membranes, right? There's a specific. We're not going to be able a to range. absolute yeah specific range. We're not going to be absolutely be able to decimate the the polyunsaturated fat content in the membranes. There's always going to be some amount. The question is how much are you going to have within that particular range? And it seems being on the lower side is better. And the other thing is it also seems that the membranes will regulate or the cells will regulate the membranes omega six and omega three content. As long as you're not given a large excess of either omega-6 or omega-3. So uh, in the West, in the Western context, what we currently have is just a massive omega-6 intake and a relatively low omega-3 intake. And then basically they're showing, oh, well, there's benefits with having omega, like more omega-3s inside the membrane can uh, with or associations of, of that with lifespan. But it could just be a function of Either they have a, those people have a low linoleic acid intake or a low omega-6 intake overall, and or they have low oxidative stress is another piece that I think is really important to the overall picture. So the goal, again, is the context is important to understand these things through. And the Maasai people here, what you're seeing is that their cells are maintaining their membranes at an appropriate level, despite not having a massive omega-3 intake. And what's allowing them to do that is they just don't have a massive omega-6 intake overall. Uh, so... As far as solutions, as far as like practical takeaways and trying to bridge the gap between this idea of, well, where are we seeing this benefit here? And then, but we're seeing uh, more unsaturated fat in the membrane causing problems with lifespan. It's, it's, I think it, this helps to bridge the gap, this understanding of implementation and these pieces of information help to put the, the pieces of the puzzle together. Maybe the puzzle's not entirely complete yet. We're, we're starting to actually fill in the different pieces and, and go from there. And I think this helps to solve some of that paradox. Absolutely. And again, just to note, as you were saying, how different this is from Western diets. Typical high PUFA oils and high PUFA you know, chicken, pork, those things will be around 30% PUFA generally, give or take. And so a diet that's about 9% of the fat that you're consuming, only 9% is PUFA, is a third of that. That's huge. And that's not even that low. No. I mean, that's like we both consume diets that are considerably lower in PUFA than 9% of, of our fat intake. So there's, we're not saying that it, it's, it's not outlandish to think that the, there is a good portion of the population that could be consuming lower amounts of PUFA in their diet. They can be cooking mostly at home using olive oil, you know, eating avocados, those things are about 10% PUFA, you know, eating lean meats and things like that. They're, you know, having some dairy, maybe they're not going to be getting very much PUFA. And if they're eating a low fat diet overall, so the Maasai don't eat a low fat diet, they're eating a 30% fat diet. If somebody's eating a lower fat diet, let's say 20%, well, then to get the same amount of PUFA, if they ate a 15% PUFA diet, 
then I'm pretty sure that would be like a 12% PUFA diet, whatever it would be, then they would still be getting the same total PUFA intake as the Maasai were. So well, again, not controlling for diet in those original association studies, I think is huge. Not controlling for not only omega-6 intake, but total fat intake, you know, the people who are concerned about their health and are trying to eat low fat still, I mean, those people are going to inherently have higher amounts of omega-3s in their fossil lipids. Yeah, I think the dietary control piece is huge, especially because inside Western countries, the <laughs> the omega-6 content or the omega-6 intake is going to be really high for most people across yeah. the board. And so that can also go with healthy user bias in general, because people who are tend to towards those healthier diets are probably going to go towards lower fat and are probably going to stay away from things that are number one, a high, super high on omega-6, unless they're like high fat, nut eating vegans. Um, <laughs> or, and even more so, they're going to stay away from already pre-oxidized uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids, which are like the heated oils that you find in most of the products, which are, are another like huge piece here that I think can cause a ton of problems with a bunch of different things. But overall, yeah, that's really important piece that none of the studies really looked or adjusted for that confounding variable. And considering mm -hmm. the Western context, that's a huge deal. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. And even when we looked at, you know, they were looking at omega-6 to omega-3 ratio, that's still not looking at total omega-6 intake, total fat intake, which when you look at the Messiah, and we'll talk about this later, they don't have a low omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. It's actually very high. I believe it's above seven or around seven. So what that's really pointing to is that it's not even the ratio, it's really just the amount of omega-6s, uh, which again is is another layer here that wasn't looked at. <laughs> All right, we're going to end that episode there and pick back up in part two, where we'll be discussing the studies that show that fish oil and cod liver oil supplementation increase oxidative damage in humans. We'll also be discussing why omega-3s are harmful in both healthy and unhealthy humans, why omega-3 supplements, even in the triglyceride form that are not oxidized and contain antioxidants, are still not a good idea to consume. We'll also be discussing the harmful metabolic and hormetic effects of omega-3s, and the research showing that omega-3s do not improve chronic health conditions or mortality in humans. If you did enjoy today's episode, please leave a like or comment if you are watching on YouTube. And if you're listening elsewhere, please leave a review or five-star rating on iTunes. All of those things really do a lot to help support the podcast and are very much appreciated. To check out the show notes for today's episode, where you can take a look at the studies and articles and anything else that we referenced throughout today's episode, head over to jfeldmanwellness.com slash podcast. And if you're looking to optimally support your metabolism and lose weight, improve your digestion, get amazing sleep, rebalance your hormones, boost your energy, and so much more with clear action steps and strategies, along with personalized guidance from me, head over to jfeldmanwellness.com slash solution, where you can find all of the information for the Energy Balance Solution Program. This program includes customized health coaching, a video library, which includes videos on restoring gut health, losing weight without destroying your metabolism, boosting your metabolism, getting amazing restorative sleep, how to rebalance your hormones, and tons more. It also includes resources like a sample meal plan and supplement guide, as well as access to a private community. So head over to jfeldmanwellness.com solution to check out all the details. And with that, I'll see you in the next episode.